If you had pots of money to pamper yourself with, what car would you choose? How about a traditional Bentley? Or maybe a more refined drive could be obtained by putting a BMW 7 Series on your wish list. We drive variants of both this week, the best of British versus the best of German luxury. The names Royal, Ian Royal, secret agent 003 and a half, licensed to be thrilled. My mission today is to drive this BMW 750iL and work out why the real James Bond chose a German car over a more traditional mark, perhaps like an Aston Martin. This is a car packed full of gimmicks and gadgetry with more than enough computer power to send a rocket into space. The BMW 750iL is a car with a whopping engine, 5.4 litres and a V12 that purrs around town, but when you unleash it on the open road, it growls with pleasure at its unleashing. It has 326 brake horsepower, more than enough to take the car to 60 miles per hour in 6 seconds and a limited top speed of 155 miles per hour. Even the steering wheel is a minefield of technology. You get controls for the radio, the telephone, the cruise control. There's a button to recirculate the air should it become stuffy here in the cabin, heavens forbid. And you can even have a heated steering wheel. A touch of the button will warm it for you on a cold winter morning. All around the car are these sensors which work the park distance control. Now they send a signal back inside the car to the dashboard which beeps at you as you get close to an obstruction, say a villain in a multi-storey car park. On your way to the casino for a game of Baccarat with Blofeld, then what better than in the back of the 750 IL? You get an extra five inches of legroom back here as well as electric seats, heated seats, double glazed windows, and these security blinds. What better way than to while away a few minutes and enjoy a vodka martini, shaken but not stirred. Now, you may think you can't have much fun in a car as big as this, but believe me, you can. The long wheelbase 7 Series is nearly 18 feet long and over 6 feet wide. They don't come much bigger, believe me. But drive it hard, push it fast into a corner, and it responds perfectly. Your rear passengers may feel a little shaken or stirred, but you'll have the smile of someone who's just been to bed with pussy galore. One of the reasons the car is so sure-footed on the road is that it's fitted with two traction control systems. Yes, two. You get automatic stability control and traction and dynamic stability control, and they equal a great handling car. The moment the computers in the car think you're about to lose control, get into trouble, they cut in and help you out. You'd have to do something very stupid to lose control of this car. So, what sort of secret agent salary would you need to buy this car? Well, a whopping one, that's for sure. You'll need deep pockets to be able to afford the £75,000 price tag, and there's very little in the way of extras. And the mind boggles at the amount of computers in the car, enough to send, perhaps, Moonraker into space. It's not a car for your friendly mechanic from the local garage to be messing about with. So, did 007 James Bond make the right choice in choosing a 750 BMW? Well, perhaps after so many narrow escapes, he thought it was the time to have something a little more comfortable than his trusty Aston Martin. And this car fits the bill perfectly. BMW certainly pulled a masterstroke in getting their cars into the Bond films. But you can't help feeling that perhaps he'd be more suited to driving a Bentley Continental Coupe, for instance. But even that's not British anymore. For me, 003 and a half, this car fits the bill perfectly. Miss Money Grabber, book me a flight to Munich, will you? Now, arriving at five-star luxury hotels is all about arriving in style. You might think that a helicopter pad and a helicopter could be the perfect way. I don't think so. If you give me the chance, I reckon I'd make a bigger impression turning up at the doors in my Bentley.
£255,000. That's what it would cost you to buy this Bentley Sedanka Coupe. But this is a Bentley with a non too subtle difference. Bentley say they wanted to make the ultimate statement when they made this car and that's why we've got this hideous burnt orange metallic colour. 50% of these cars are going to go to the Sunshine States of America and you've guessed it, the old Yanks demand something very, very extrovert. But personally, I think the original Bentley boys will be turning in their grave. So what's it like driving a mobile fortune? First impression is of absolute comfort. It's like sitting on a large throne. It also feels frighteningly powerful. That's probably because it's got a 6.7 litre monster engine with 400 brake horsepower that will propel this two and a half tonnes worth of metal from naught to 60 in a frightening 6.1 seconds. Should you be allowed, it would also take you rapidly to 155 miles an hour. I was really apprehensive before I got in. I mean, 250,000, that's a quarter of a million pounds. To be honest, I was more than apprehensive. I was bloody scared. I mean, what if somebody bumps into you? But the fact is, everybody is paying homage to you. There's no navigation system. I mean, you even get one of those in a Vauxhall Vectra. That's optional in the Bentley, though. And I wouldn't have minded having a TV screen. You get one of those in a BMW 5 Series. Well, there's a herd of cows being sacrificed for the leather for this, and by God, though, it was worth it, because comfort-wise, I am just sitting in seventh heaven here. It is so relaxing. The only danger is you can imagine yourself nodding off. And as for the back, well, to be quite frank, there is no room at all, or very little. This is definitely not the Bentley you want to be chauffeured in. This is a driver's car, and this is the place you want to be. You don't feel too cramped, though, because you've got the ultimate sunroof. Two removable panels, second sunroof for the people sitting in the back, and this Bentley converts, at the touch of a button, into a soft-top sports car. Incredible thing about Bentley owners is, apparently, the average one owns between six and ten cars, including at least two supercars like a Ferrari and a Porsche 911. It's a hard life being a Bentley owner. Behind all the typically traditional Bentley wood and all the rest of it though, this Bentley is an absolute aristocratic hooligan. Not surprisingly, you don't see too many Bentley owners doing the shopping, using them for the day-to-day -day things. So, anyway, here we are. Let's just park up. No wonder they don't like uh, parking Bentleys at supermarkets. I've just found out why. At nearly 18 foot, they're a nightmare. You do realise, of course, that the Bentley badge is now actually no longer a Bentley because, of course, it's owned by Volkswagen. Good news is that they intend, they say, keeping the badge and everything else about the car just so. What it'll mean though is they're going to invest 500 million pounds of their money on a new model range of Bentleys. So that's it. I've had my amazing day as king of the road, but let's get back to reality. This car is still £255,000. For that, you could buy six people's homes here. So, do I want to be Mr Sensible? I don't think so. What I really want is to keep my motoring fantasy. Vauxhall and General Motors have probably never had it so good because in the past five years their flagship Amiga 
has been consistently at the top of the executive car charts. In that time, they've beaten off the likes of the Ford Scorpio and the Rover 800. They've literally beaten those two cars into submission. The quirky frog-eyed Scorpio we never really took to and the Rover 800, after all, was just a Rover. So Vauxhall have taken the decision to freshen the Amiga range up, give it a new lease of life for the next three to four years before their next generation executive saloons and estates arrive. It's a very welcome upgrade to a car that's such a familiar sight on our roads. In fact, since its introduction in 1994, some 600,000 Amigas have been built at the plant in Germany. Indeed, Britain and Germany are the main markets for the Amiga. Three out of four buyers choose the saloon over the estate. And Vauxhall say that their designers and engineers have changed over a third of the car's 8,000 components. The most obvious are its exterior looks with a new bonnet and boot, new front and rear lights, colour keyed bumpers and sills and new ranges of alloy wheels, plus a new 2.2 litre four cylinder engine that now makes, if my sums are right, five engines to choose from. The entry level 2 litre 16 valve, the new to the range 2.2, the 2.5 V6, the 2.5 turbo diesel and the 3 litre V6, all available in manual or auto and in saloon or estate. Now, moving inside, again, it's an all-new interior. Vauxhall have tried to create, well, a touch of luxury, and I think they've pretty much succeeded. The dashboard has a soft-touch feel to it. There's a new centre console with heating and ventilation controls and a brand-new stereo system, too. Now, Vauxhall, like most manufacturers, are incorporating a satellite navigation system into the car, and you can have the option of a 5-inch television monitor screen right there, giving you the sat-nav. There's plenty of space for passengers and some handy storage bins too. It has to be said that the Amiga was always a decent car to drive. Rear wheel drive, a decent chassis and setup. And if you pick the 3 litre V6, well a real stormer of an engine. 211 brake horsepower on tap and very respectable 0 to 60 times of just over 8 seconds, top speed of 150 miles an hour. The 3 litre V6 of course continues into the new range in either Elite or MV6 form. This is the MV6 and this in my opinion is the pick of the bunch. It gets a lowered sport suspension by 15 millimeters, stiffer ride, a touch anyway, and unique alloy wheels and an aluminium dashboard. The base 2-litre engines don't really offer much get-up-and-go when pulling such a big car with only 136 brake horsepower. The 2.2-litre engine already seen in the Sintra produces 144 brake horsepower and the 2.5 V6 gets 170. If you must have diesel, well, you can have the 2.5-litre inline 6 with 130 brake horsepower. But stand by because next year a flagship Amiga will be available with an aluminium 300 brake horsepower V8 engine, the same as we've seen in the Corvette. Now, although Vauxhall make great play of competing with the main German manufacturers like Mercedes, BMW and Audi, in reality, the user chooser company car driver who has perhaps 25 to 30,000 pounds to spend on their next car, well, I'm afraid they're going to choose an E-Class or an A6 or a 5 Series over the Amiga, no matter how good this car is. The company car driver who doesn't have a choice, well, this is no bad car to have in their driveway. But perhaps the main rivals for the new Amiga are the Saab 95, the Volvo S80 or the new Rover 75. So the Amiga, not before time, has had a very welcome facelift, and that's really all that's happened with the car. The underpinnings remain the same as the outgoing Amiga model. It's very spacious, it's extremely well built. It's a car that can take on the might of Mercedes, BMW and Audi. It's just a shame it's got the wrong badge on it. One wonders what life must have been like in the 20s and 30s if you were one of the famous Bentley boys. Dashing men who lived life to the full, drank hard and raced hard at famous circuits all over Europe. Right through the decades, the factory at Crewe have produced some truly memorable cars. How about this one? A 1956 Bentley Continental S1 Fastback, which if you're interested, is for sale at this dealership in Cheshire, price around £45,000. It's absolutely immaculate. It stands the test of time even today. But if you want a Bentley today, the car to buy is this, 
the new Arnage Saloon. But is it good enough to take on the world's best and transport Bentley into the new millennium? Now, I've never driven a car before that costs as much money as this one does, and to be honest, it's rather a daunting thought. When you think that the average house price across the UK is about £75,000, and that this car costs twice as much, it's a worrying thought, maybe. However, the days of Bentley buyers being sat back there, lapping it up in the rear, thankfully are generally over. What's the point in buying this sort of car and not being able to enjoy it? You want to be sat here at the heart of things, reveling in all that power from a BMW engine. The shame of it. The Arnage and the Silver Seraph, both launched in 1998, were styled by Graham Hull. It's an all new body shell over the previous Rolls and Bentley models with greater torsional rigidity, giving improved aerodynamics and fuel efficiency. It has a very sleek appearance, certainly when compared to the previous model anyway, with flowing lines. It sits fairly low on the road and has a drag coefficient of 0.37, a 12% improvement on the old model. The name Arnage, by the way, comes from the famous Le Mans circuit. It's one of the corners there. And the heritage with Le Mans continues with the name Arnage, as well as with the new concept car launched at Geneva, the Hunandiers, which, well, quite frankly, received a very mixed reception on press day. People were not quite so sure about it. Maybe Dr. Piesch and his gang have misjudged badly what a Bentley buyer wants to see in the future. A manual gearbox, a mid-engined car, not so sure about that. The Anage gets an all new suspension. Mounted on steel subframes with an independent double wishbone configuration, front and rear, which improves the ride and the handling. This is no wallowy large saloon, that's for sure. Now, the Anage and the Silver Serif are basically the same shape, apart from with the Bentley you get a few extra spoilers. And it's a shape that has grown on me tremendously since I've had this car. And of course, the Bentley has this wonderful, wonderful distinctive mesh grille. But under the bonnet is what you want to know about. And this is where you get the four and a half litre all aluminium engine from BMW. Now, it's basically the same engine that's in the 740. Thank goodness it's been worked on, it's been modified. It now has twin water-cooled turbochargers. It pumps out 350 brake horsepower, 413 pounds foot of torque, which makes it very, very fast. It's just a shame that when you flip the lid and you look at the engine, it's not a hand-built engine anymore. Now, as you would expect, stepping into a Bentley is an experience all in itself with this gorgeous, finest Connolly leather. The wood, the chrome, the thick Wilton carpets that your feet almost get lost in. It's like spending a day in a gentleman's club. However, would you expect to find cup holders from a 7 Series in a Bentley? No, not really. Would you expect to find switch gear from a 7 Series in a Bentley? Again, no, and it's perhaps these controls for the climate system which disappoint the most. However, you get used to them. The rest of the car is just magnificent. These gorgeous cream dials, the chrome, the wood, the leather. It makes you realise the amount of work that's gone into producing this car. It will be very interesting to see how Volkswagen develop the Bentley brand, as they will certainly have to do after paying so much money for it. The range currently consists of the Arnage and four variants of the Coupe, the Soft Top Azure, Continental R and T, and the newest arrival, the Sedanka SC, which you may have seen Ken Gibson driving recently on Motor Week. Baby Bentleys, updated coupes, who knows what we'll see in the future. Power to the rear wheels of the Anage is handled superbly by a five-speed automatic ZF gearbox, which has two modes, normal and sport. If you fancy a blast down country lanes, well, flick it into sport mode, and the ultra-fast kickdown will have you rocketing towards the horizon so fast you'll hardly have time to catch your breath. It really is an astonishingly quick car. 
The growl you hear from the engine under normal driving becomes a full-blooded roar once you open the Anage up. The throttle is light and crisp. There's no discernible turbo lag. One criticism of the car, though, is the amount of wind noise that comes into the cabin when cruising on the motorway, particularly here around the A-pillars. The brakes are superb thanks to a new power boost brake system with four channel ABS and micro alloy discs too. The ride is slightly firm, the handling is good and the steering just nicely weighted to give the right amount of feedback. 0-60 comes up in 6.2 seconds which for such a big car is still astonishing. Top speed has been limited to a mere 150 miles per hour. Gone are the days when the company wouldn't release power and performance figures, describing them as merely adequate. Now they want to sing them from the rooftops. The old phrase about if you have to ask how many miles to the gallon it does, you can't afford it, well, I suppose it's still relevant. But even if I could afford this car, I'd like to know how many miles it does do to a gallon or a tank. Are you sitting down? Well, 12 miles per gallon urban, 16 combined, with a tank that takes nearly 21 gallons. It'll set you back well over 60 pounds to fill up. Still, most Bentley owners have about four other cars in the garage, so I guess they can afford it. Despite its huge size, it's surprisingly easy to hustle this car fast down country lanes. The grip and the cornering are tremendous and the power just keeps coming and coming. Mind you, this is one car I wouldn't like to take down a narrow country lane. Meet something coming the other way and it's doubtful if the driver will doff his cap and offer to uh, move out of the way for you, governor. So, is the Anage a good car? Certainly. Is it a great car? Possibly. Is it a car that's worthy of the Bentley mark? Absolutely. But can you say it's worth the £145,000 purchase price that this will cost you? Well, that has to be subjective. If this is just another car in your fleet, well, you probably hardly notice the dent in your bank balance it would take to buy this car. A new S-Class is half the price of the Anage, for instance. You could probably buy a row of terraced houses in some parts of the country, but an ocean-going yacht is considerably more expensive than this. And that's the sort of context that you have to take with cars that cost this amount of money. Is it to be another rare masterpiece to hang on the walls of your mansion or a Bentley Anage? There's only one answer for me, and it's this. It may not be the best car in the world, but it certainly beats staring at a picture. <laughs>